This last year, we saw SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intel, uh, Intelligence. I'm very tired. It's New Year's Day. I'm looking for a Starbucks. We'll see if they're open. Um, we saw SETI get all excited because they found out in space what they thought might be evidences of an alien intelligent civilization. Now, their criteria for making this leap was uh, that they detected a semblance of uh, order in some signals they received that distinguished those signals from a chaotic and random backdrop. So, my thought when I saw this, my brother actually sent me the news article, I was just like, boy, we are capable of such, such a self-deception, um, cognitive dissonance, and really hypocrisy. And I, was, I told him, um, look, this generation discovered that all life is based on a digital programming language that we've discovered the predictable syntax to this language and how it works. And by knowing that syntax, we are able to make edits in the language to affect desired changes in organisms that are based on that language. So, and obviously I'm talking about DNA. Um, and yet, our scientists insist that all of this came about as the product of random chance, random accident. Life is the product of nothing. And yet, the same scientists get excited when they look out at the stars and see something that they think is light years away that's evidence of an intelligence because they see order in the signals against a backdrop of what they assume to be random noise. Why doesn't the same rule apply in their own backyard? I, I made the joke, you know, if you were to send these scientists off to talk to the aliens, the aliens would see that they're insane immediately. They'd probably just come and nuke us because it's insanity to hold these two totally contradictory uh, views when you're looking far you're able to apply the right rules but when you look close up you're not willing to do that why? it's because there's a sickness in your heart and there's a sickness in the heart of mankind that causes him to want to snuff out God and that sickness is sin that's what the Bible calls it now not only do we have this digital programming language that clearly shows us that this life on this planet was designed by an intelligence with forethought who developed the rules of, of the language that would um, govern life before life came about because life is dependent on the language uh, not only do we have that but we also have in especially in the United States gathering dust on every bookshelf and every library and every hotel and every uh, basement <laughs> there's at least probably one copy of the Bible which we've known for anybody who's looked at it honestly over the last couple thousand years knows that this is a message system that exhibits a design that is beyond what humans could ever put together. And, you know, my favorite teacher used to say, here we have 66 books written over thousands of years by more than 40 authors in three language, and yet on closer examination we discover it is an integrated message system in which every detail is placed in such a way as to exhibit a design from a designer that clearly transcends time and space. It is an extraterrestrial message system. So we're looking out at the 
universe for signs of intelligence, but we won't look at the same signs in our own backyard, and meanwhile, the author of the whole universe, and the author of life, and the author of DNA, gave us a message system that we refuse to read. Now, he authenticated that message system by predicting the history of his people in advance, and that's called prophecy. So, while the Bible was closed 2,000 years ago, meaning no further Bible has been written, it accurately uh, describes the events that we're living through today. We're being plunged into a time about which the Bible has more to say than any other time in human history. And I defy you to read it honestly and not come to the same conclusion. So if you are an intellectually honest person, these are some things to think about. Is the idea that the universe sprang out of nothing by accident and the order that you see in this universe and life itself, is that not evidence of a higher power? And there are good things in this universe that you should be thankful for. You should be thankful that you live on a planet that was fine-tuned for you to live. And you should be thankful not only that, but you were created in the image of God with certain gifts and talents and aspirations and qualities and hopes and dreams and the capacity to pursue them. You should be thankful. We should be thankful. And we're not by nature. We want to shut out the existence of God because we don't want to be accountable to anybody. And yet we blame him. We love to blame him for, well, if there's a God, well, how would he let so much suffering happen in my life? And okay, on the one hand, you want to shut him out. You want your autonomy and you don't want him to have anything to do with you. You want him to leave you alone. And then on the other hand, you want to blame him for all the problems in your life. You cannot have it both ways. The Bible says that we know the truth inside of us. All of creation declares his glory on the one hand. So we're without excuse just looking at the creation because it manifests his attributes. He flung the universe into existence and holds it together by the word of his power. And every day the universe tells us that our God is a God of order our God is a mighty God who has created an environment for us to live in. And we also have the voice of our conscience inside of us, excusing and accusing our actions, which shows us that there is a judgment for man. At the end of our life, our conscience is going to be ringing loud and clear as the judgment is read about our life and that's what we really don't want to deal with because we know we have a sin problem okay inside we know we have a sin problem we know that there's a creator and we develop uh, complicated philosophies and bodies of knowledge that we call science that are falsely called science and we do that to shield ourselves from the truth that we don't want to deal with which is God created me and I owe him my life and I've got a problem because I don't know God and I don't live in a way that my conscience uh, agrees with and that means that there's a problem with me and at the deepest level we actually know we're broken and ruined and that's really the problem it's not uh, that we can't intellectually embrace certain things um, or that certain things are unreasonable or implausible to us. That's a lie. The real problem is that we know the truth and we suppress it in unrighteousness. That's how the Bible talks about it, that we suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which can be known of God in our natural senses is 
plainly known to us and yet we refuse to look at it and it's because inwardly we know that we're ruined and broken and we fear God now that's not the way it's supposed to be and we are afraid of God because we don't realize that he is a great he's not only our creator and he's not only our judge he's a physician and he longs for us to open up to him and accept his diagnosis which is this you're ruined you have to be recreated there is no way that you can stand in the presence of the living God who is a consuming fire and live you will perish in that fire because you are mortal fallen corruptible sinful broken and ruined now if you can accept that diagnosis and it's not easy it will break you that realization will break your strength and all the little things that you've relied on in your life to hold up the facade of a personality that you've created you will fall apart but when you fall apart if you're under this kind of realization that not only is he accurately diagnosing but he's able to heal you'll fall apart on a pillow that he's created for you called grace and it's wonderful to fall into that pillow now what you need as the remedy for your problem with God is not to hide from him but to open up to him and believe the message that he's given which is this God loves you and he created you and yes because of sin you are alienated from him and you want nothing to do with him and not only that but in your mind you're his enemy and yet God is in the business of reconciling his enemies to himself and making them his friends and the way he does, does that and the way he did it and the way he told us about it is by coming and becoming a man and living in the human condition and his name was Jesus and he was tempted in every point like us but he was without sin he was a genuine man and yet he was God himself he said when you see me you see the father he said that I dwell in the father and the father dwells in me there's a mystery that the tri the, the triune God the God who is the father son and the Holy Spirit came and embodied himself in human flesh and lived a genuine human life and when he did it he didn't come in and thrown himself in Rome he hid himself in a manger and lived a poor life a base life of no reputation until his time came to be manifested and to announce the good news of the kingdom which he did and you know what happened he was killed for it now that death seems like a tragedy to the world but actually it was ordained from the foundation of the world that Jesus Christ would die because the life in him needed to get out so he said in John 12 unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies it abides alone but if it dies it springs up and bears much fruit what he was talking about is that the life that is in him that perfect life the eternal incorruptible indestructible life of God himself was embodied in a man who went to death in order to release that life and give it as a free gift to everyone who would receive it that life is multipliable and the picture we have of that is seed time and harvest farmer goes and plants a seed and out of it comes a plant right well this life when I, I'm actually that's one plant but when the farmer plants seeds he gets a multiplied return God is a great farmer and he's taken his life and put it in a seed named Jesus Christ and when that seed was broken open yeah he rose from the dead but his life is springing forth to bear a harvest uh, to God of many children so 
God says that if you believe in the whole message, that you're a sinner, that you're broken, that you are in need of God, that you are alienated from him, and that you need his cure, and that he made that cure available by giving us his son, Jesus Christ, who shed his blood to pay the price for our sins, and who raised from the dead and gave his spirit, his life, you can have that eternal life. Jesus said that anyone who believes in him, as the scriptures had said, rivers of living water would flow from their innermost being. And it says this, he spoke of the spirit who was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. When Jesus was glorified, that just means that he was raised from the dead and enthroned. And the spirit that was in him, that was his incorruptible eternal life that was manifesting God in his human virtues, which we can see in the Gospels. He lived a life, when you look at the Gospels, you're looking at a human being who lived a life that no human has ever lived, expressing God. You've never seen anyone speak the way he did, act the way he did. Trust me, if you read the Gospels and look for any sin in him, any incorruptibility, or any corruptibility, you will not find it. And you will wonder, because how could sinful human authors construct a myth like this when their own nature doesn't allow for the kind of purity we see exhibited in Jesus? Well, what was the source of that purity? It is the eternal life of the Son of God. And he gave that life for you and for me. And he says, whoever believes in me will not perish, but have eternal life. There is no work required. That is because the expectation is too high for you to ever, ever reach. The work for you to attain salvation, you couldn't do. Jesus had to do it because you're ruined and he's healthy. The doctor is the one who performs the surgery, not the patient. So all you need to do is believe and you know it may be a process for you read the bible think about what i've said this is is a random video i'm very tired and so i kind of like go in different directions but i hope you get the thread that the there is a message for you to read called the bible that describes this person and his life and the gift that he offers and we're offended by that message because we refuse to be diagnosed and we back so far away from that diagnosis that we refuse to even admit there's a doctor or a sickness and we don't want anything to do with it and yet if you can open your heart and realize in 2019 you know what I'm ruined oh man it's a good place to be because now that qualifies you to open your mind and read the Bible and look at the words of Jesus and the apostles and see what they said. They promised, Jesus promised, God promises that if you just believe in him and believe in the work he accomplished, he will give you his Holy Spirit and he'll give you the eternal life. That doesn't mean that you know, just go to heaven and live forever as you. You'd be miserable if you had to be you for forever. That's why he guarded uh, the tree of life and didn't let us have access to it once we'd fallen because he didn't want us to live forever in our fallen, corruptible condition. No, there's a new incorruptible life that God wants to give you, which is the life of the Son of God. And he wants you to be like him and reign with him for eternity. He created this universe for Jesus Christ and for those to whom he would give his life, who would be together the children of God and would live in a universe forever where there's no sin, no sickness, no sorrow, no death, no tears, no suffering of any kind, only joy and then wonders that we can't even imagine. We don't, we don't even know what it'll be like when eternity rolls in and we get to spend it with God himself. And the Bible, that message system I talked about, tells us that it's soon. 
We are the generation that's going to see this all come to pass. We're the generation that's going to see the harvest of the seeds God planted. So it's an exciting time to be alive if you're on the right team. And to be the, on the right team, you need to just open yourself up to the Lord and receive Him and believe in Him. Um, so how do you get saved? How do you receive eternal life? believe in the Son of God. The scriptures are very clear about that. Works cannot justify you because you don't have it in you to live the kind of life that God requires to be in his kingdom. You have to be sinless, incorruptible, immortal, holy, righteous, and full of love and light. That And there can be no spot in you. That's what the kingdom of God requires. And you can't make that happen only God can make that happen by clothing you with himself and giving you a new life. But he's not going to do that if you don't want it. He, no one's going to be in the kingdom who doesn't want to be there. And you do have that autonomy. You know, you blame him for your troubles. We all do. But we want him to leave us alone. That's not going to fly. If you want him to leave him alone, if you he want if you want him to leave you alone in this life, he's going to leave you alone in the next, and you don't want that. What you want is to be reconciled to God, and that's what he wants for you. And he loves you, and he created you, and he has unbelievable things in store for you. If you'll just humble yourself, drop your the false knowledge that causes you to hide from him. And just open up and say, okay, God, I want to know you. I believe you're real. Show me. And then read the Bible because that's his message system. And, you know, I don't have time to prove it right now, but it is a amazing designed message system from beyond space and time to you. A love letter written in the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And everybody in the world thinks we're crazy who believe it and they want us to die. <laughs> And it's because that's there. We represent the problem. We represent this alienation. But you know what? Once you get past that and you receive the Lord, everything is different because now you're the one who was your judge is your friend. And the one who you feared, you now love and you now want to be near because he's so attractive. And in his presence, there's fullness of joy. The people who know the Lord have joy and peace. And you know what? I wouldn't trade that for anything because I lived most of my life, half of my life so far, suppressing the knowledge of God and denying him and resisting him and all of that. And it's much better on this side. Trust me. It doesn't matter if people hate, hate you if God is for you. Um, well, that's all I have to say for now. This probably was not the clearest gospel message, and I'm sorry to everyone who has the ability to articulate that. I'm not an evangelist, but if someone listens to this message who's not uh, doesn't know the Lord yet, I do hope that they'll get enough in it to make them attracted to the truth.